That's so you make sure you look good is what it's for. And so they're posing, they're flexing in there. And then, and then I hear people grunting all over the place. You know, men grunting, trying to get, you know, 250 pounds off their chest. And a guy's above them going, one more, one more. You can do it. Don't be a girl. You could say that in the 80s. Screaming and yelling in their faces, they're trying to get this off. I said, what kind of a place is this? Yeah, I didn't get into it. I, I worked out for a little bit, and then I stopped. And I was more interested in playing basketball and doing those types of things. But it was just crazy to see how some people were so in to this idea of working out and causing pain. I mean, they were screaming out in pain, people yelling at them, calling them names just so they can do one more rep. I said, you know, that's not me. I'm not one of those guys. And there are those people in the world who enjoy discipline. And maybe you're here today and you just love discipline. But I'm one of the other multiplied millions of people in the world that don't enjoy discipline. If you don't enjoy it, say amen. Okay, I'm with some company here. You're not all gym rats going and working out every day in the mirror, enjoying the pain. But most people go through the pain of working out and physical exercise and dieting because they want to get to a, a goal. Because they're trying to accomplish something other than, for most of them, than just the pain of working out. And when we talk about spiritual disciplines, we're talking about some things that are painful for us. Some things that don't always come very easy. Like spending regular time in God's Word. Now, that's not too difficult once you start reading it. You know why? Because it's a really good read. So as you start to read it and you discipline yourself to, to begin that process and take that time, pretty soon it becomes a lot easier and you actually enjoy it. Enjoy it. Prayer, similarly, is difficult in the beginning to discipline yourself to a prayer life and distractions come and pull us away from it. But as we begin to practice the habit of prayer, we find that we look forward to that time with the Lord and it becomes enjoyable. Same thing with church attendance. That's another spiritual discipline of attending church regularly, gathering together with other believers to worship God. If you have a church that you love to be a part of, and, and I pray that that's here for City Church for you, then you actually enjoy coming and making that uh, time for the Lord. But fasting, I don't know if it ever becomes enjoyable. I don't know if this spiritual discipline, we ever get to the place where we say, yeah, we ju I just love to fast. It just gets easier and easier for me. I've never found that to be the case in my life, and probably you haven't either. And maybe some of you here have never fasted before, and you don't even know what this whole thing is all about. So that's why we're going to talk about it. But it is a spiritual discipline, and it is necessary, um, a necessary part of our communion with God if we want to hear from God, if we want God to move in our lives. We need to understand the importance of fasting. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he, he speaks of these two things almost within the same breath, prayer and fasting. If you look in chapter 6 of Matthew, and we will here in just a moment, you'll see that he speaks of prayer in his sermon, and then immediately after, he goes right into fasting, and that's because there is a connection between these two things that we, we really shouldn't separate. Many of the times, in fact, in the Bible, when you see that they were praying, it, it, there's also the implication as well that they were fasting as they prayed. It's an important part. Listen, you can pray without fasting, but you should never fast without praying. It's kind of like bread and butter. You can have bread without butter, but don't eat butter without the bread. It doesn't taste very good. So prayer and fasting is the same. You can pray without the fast, but please, when we fast, we need to know that the fasting is to get, um, to get closer to God, to be closer to Jesus, to walk closer to the Spirit. And that's going to require more than just fasting, but it also requires this element of prayer. So fasting, is it biblical? Look in Matthew 16, or Matthew 6, verses 16 to 18. It says this, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, 
so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who, is unse who sees what is done in secret will reward you. You notice it says here in that first verse, when you fast. It doesn't say if you fast, but it says when you fast. The same thing, if you look a few verses uh, uh, before this with prayer, Jesus says, when you pray, not if you pray, but when you pray. It was expected by Jesus that we would fast. So when you fast, this is how you fast. In Matthew chapter 9, verse number 15, the Pharisees are complaining about Jesus' disciples because they weren't fasting. And so... Jesus answered them and says, How can the guest of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? And the, and the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they what? Will fast. Jesus said, Listen, why I'm here, they're not going to fast. But as soon as I go away, then they will fast. It was expected by Jesus that you and I would be people of prayer and of fasting. Jesus Exemplified this. He modeled this for us in Matthew chapter 4 when he went away for 40 days for a season of prayer and fasting in the wilderness. Here's some more. Acts chapter 14, verse 23. Look at what it says about the disciples. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and what? And with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. The chapter before that in verse chapter 13 verse 2 and while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting the Holy Spirit said set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them so the early church was a church that fasted their leadership fasted the people fasted they fasted so is this a biblical practice it most certainly is a biblical practice so what is fasting then what is it thank you for asking here's we're going to dive into it if you're writing notes, write this definition down. It won't be on the screen, so you'll have to write. Fasting is giving up something good for something better. Fasting is giving up something good for something better. I don't like Brussels sprouts. Just don't enjoy them. It's not my, one of my favorite foods. In fact, I avoid it. I don't like olives. Don't, don't care for them. I won't eat them. Don't even talk to me about olives. Don't want anything to do with olives. I don't like avocado. Sorry for all you guacamole lovers. Can't stand gua avocado, guacamole. It wouldn't be much of a fast for me to say, Lord, I'm going to give up avocado and olives and Brussels sprouts. Because for me, I'm not giving up anything good. None of that is good for me. I don't enjoy any of that. So a true fast is giving up something good for something better. Fasting is almost exclusively connected to food in the Bible. It's always a, a fast when you talk about fasting. When you look into the Old Testament, the New Testament, it's always referring to food. Because next to air and water, it is the most necessary thing that we have, food. I don't get much pleasure out of drinking water. In fact, I have to force myself to drink those, whatever it is, for glasses eight ounce glasses or six or whatever i mean i have to force myself to chug down that water every day because i know it's good for me i don't get enjoyment out of drinking water i really don't think about breathing air i know if it was gone i would miss it you know pretty quick but i don't think about wow this oh man i just i'm really enjoying the air today but food you can tell by looking at me that i enjoy my food i enjoy spaghetti and meat sauce i enjoy lasagna yeah, I enjoy ravioli. You get the theme here of Italian food. Yeah, I enjoy food. I'll eat, I'll eat Thai food. I'll eat comfort food. I'll eat Chinese food. I'll eat Mexican food. I'll eat Caribbean. I mean, I love food. So if you ever invite me to eat, you don't have to worry about what you're making because chances are if it's not Brussels sprouts, olives, or guacamole, I'm going to love it. And I think most of you would agree you love food. You enjoy eating. There's enjoyment. There's pleasure out of eating, but it's also necessary for us to eat. And so when we fast, we are giving up something good for that which is far better. I believe, though, the key in fasting is not so much in the food that is given up, 
but it's in the sacrifice that's laid down. It's the heart of sacrifice. It's the, the idea, I am willing, God, to give up that which I love, that which I enjoy, even that which I need, in order to grab a hold of you who is far better than any of that. Fasting says, what I am seeking God for is more important to me than this. Now, uh, Dick Brogdon, who is the, the missionary who leads the Live Dead Initiative, we support many of their missionaries. Um, Dick Brogdon has been to our church before, and he's spoken from this pulpit, been our missions conference. Some of you will remember uh, when he came. But he leads his team in various fasts, and not just food fasts, but he also includes other types of fasting. And I don't think this is out of bounds. I, you're not going to find this type of fast in Scripture, but I, I think it, it meets the heart of what a fast is. And they'll do something called a screen fast. That means anything that has a screen on it. Your cell phone, your television, your iPad, your computer, whatever has a screen, they will fast screens on that, the Live Dead team. Like, no screens. Don't check the email. Don't look at your messages. None of that. No, <clears throat> no social media. We are just going to spend this time seeking after God. For some of you here, that would be a bigger challenge than giving up food for a few days. I'm just saying. For some of you here, that may be a bigger step than saying, you know what, I'm going to go on a 48-hour fast and I won't eat any food. I'm just going to drink liquids, but I won't have any food. You can more easily do that than to stay off of Facebook and to stop posting, to stop taking the selfies, and to stop looking at the text messages for some, that would be far greater of a sacrifice than even the food. Say ouch if you don't say amen. There you go. So we're fasting. We're giving up something that is pleasurable, something that is good, for something that is better. So why should I fast, though? There's the concept of the fast we see it in the Bible. We see the expectation of Jesus upon us. We see him modeling fasting. We see the early church fasting. We understand sort of the, the principle behind the fast of sacrificing something good for something better. But why? If you were an actor, you would say, what's my motivation for this scene? What's the motivation behind this fast? Why should I fast? And for that, let's turn to several scriptures. Joel chapter 2, verses 15 to 17 children of, of Israel were, were falling under the judgment of God for their disobedience. As a part of that judgment, they were in crisis. There was famine and drought, economic disaster. They were surrounded by an enemy. And so the prophet Joel says this, blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly. Next verse. You have just the 15? That's fine. Call a sacred assembly and declare a fast. Why? Because there is a time of crisis and for a season of repentance on behalf of the people. This is one of the occasions in the Bible where we see a corporate fast being called. Not just an individual fast, not one person fasting for a need that they have in their life, but we see a, the whole community fasting during a time of crisis. Maybe it's happening in your life. Maybe there's a crisis in your life. Maybe there's a crisis in your family. Maybe there's something that's, that's happening in, in the world in which you live and you're surrounded. Maybe it's in the workplace, but there's a season of crisis in your life. That's a great reason to fast. There's a great motivation for fasting and praying to God during that time of crisis. Second motivation for fasting is in Daniel Chapter 9, verse 3. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. Daniel was seeking God here for direction. If you read the rest of that chapter, you'll see that God sends a special emissary. An angel comes to Daniel and says, Daniel, the Lord has heard your prayer and your fasting, and he has answered you. You have found favor with God. And God gives him understanding. Maybe there's a season of confusion going on right now in your life that you don't understand why things are the way they are and why things are happening the way they're happening. 
there's a great motivation for prayer and fasting. You take a time and you set it apart and you say, God, I'm going to go after you. I'm going to seek you because I need understanding in my life. We all are in that place from time to time. We need to understand the things that are happening. The third, and this is probably the most obvious, we find this in Ezra chapter 8, verse 21. There was an exodus from Babylon back to Jerusalem. Israel had been taken captive, had been taken away into Babylon, and now there was a returning. And so they were, they were leaving Babylon and returning back to Jerusalem. There were some 700 miles in this journey from Babylon to Jerusalem, and they didn't have an army that was protecting them. They were really exposed, the men, the women, the children, on this long journey, exposed to all sorts of enemies. He says, there by the, by the Hava Canal, I proclaimed a fast so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for a safe journey for us and our children with all our possessions. We're praying and fasting for protection. You know, the enemy is real. The Bible says he seeks to destroy us. He's the father of all lies. He's a roaring lion who travels around the earth just looking for someone to devour. We have a real enemy. And maybe you've experienced that enemy's attack in your life. Maybe you've experienced it in your family. We certainly experience it even as a church. And you need to pray and ask God and fast and say, God, I need your protection over my family. I need your protection over my life. God, there's, there's people and there's situations that seem bent on my downfall, and I need you, God, to protect me during this season. Acts chapter 13, we just referred to that just a second ago. We can put, if you got it back, put 13, 2 back up again. It says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, what did the Holy Spirit said? He said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, who became Paul, for the work to which I have called them. Through this fast, they received direction of the Lord. How many times do we need God's direction in our lives? I mean, can we even count them? I mean, I can't. The amount of times I've come to a crossroads or come to a, 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 a place in the road where there's multiple ways that I could go or, or doors that were all open before me, and I want to know, God, which is your, your direction? Which way? Do I turn left? Do I turn right? Do I keep going straight? Do I go through this door or that door? Maybe you want me to climb in through this window, but God, I just need to know what your direction is for my life. I've shared this story before about when God directed us to the country of Paraguay and how God accomplished that in our lives and how he, he confirmed that in our lives. I thank God for a godly wife who the Lord said, fast and pray. And she went into a season of fasting and prayer. And God then confirmed that in a, in a really miraculous way in our lives, exactly where he wanted us to be during that season. This is so important that we hear from God for direction. Because sometimes, in fact, I, I say maybe more often than not, God will lead us down paths that aren't the easy way. Sometimes when God directs us, and we have two roads before us, and this one looks nice and smooth and level and grassy, and this one is all rocky, filled with potholes, sometimes God leads us down that way. And when you start heading down that way, there comes a point, several points, when you stop and say, maybe I need to go back. Maybe this isn't right. This is too difficult. This is too hard. I, I just, I don't want to be here anymore. Oh, God, I'm so sorry that I missed it. I'm going to start heading back the other way. I'll tell you, for us on the mission field, there were several times when we got to places where we just didn't want to be there anymore. We were just tired of the struggle, tired of the difficulty, tired of, of, of being homesick for family and friends and the familiar. And it was in those moments that we remembered what God had spoken to us and how God had told us, this is where I want you to be. And that kept us moving forward. You need to know that God is leading and directing your life because sometimes the way that he directs us is not easy. The last thing I want to say, and I got no scripture verse for this one because you can just find a whole bunch of them for this. But I believe that a motivation for fasting is actually anything that you're praying for. 
Whatever it is you're asking God for in prayer, you can also fast for that. In other words, you can add fasting to any part of your prayer life. If you're asking God for, for the salvation of someone you love, you can fast for that. If you're asking God for a new, a new job, fast for that. If you're asking God for healing for you or for someone else, you can fast for that. You can say to God, God, I am going to give up that which is good because I want you who is better. So how should we fast? What is sort of the practical instruction for us? Here's three things I'm going to offer you. First of all, know the why. Always know the why. Why is it that you're fasting? Don't just fast to fast. Don't just fast because someone else is. Know the why. Why is it that you're fasting? And the reason number one should always be to seek God. Reason number one should never be I'm, I'm fasting so that I can get this and so that this situation can change or so this can happen. But always know, first and foremost, that your fast is about seeking God. As I said with prayer last week, prayer is not about changing God. But prayer is what God uses to change us. Fasting is the same way. Fasting is not about changing God, but it's about letting God step into our lives and change us. Know the why. Second thing is know the, the what. How is it that you're going to fast? There are several ways to fast. I just mentioned that in the Bible exclusively, there's this fasting food, but there's some other ways in which you can fast too that I believe are profitable. But know that type of fast you're going to fast. There's partial fasts. There's a regular sort of fast. There's complete fasts. Partial fast is a fast where you say, I'm going to give up these things, also referred to as a Daniel fast. I'm not going to eat uh, any, any meats or any special foods. Daniel said, I'm just going to eat vegetables and water find that in Daniel chapter 1 and also later on as well. And, and Daniel, you see him fasting that way. He gave up all choice foods and just ate nothing but vegetables and water. You call that a Daniel fast. It's a partial fast. You can have a complete fast, which means no food and no water. Make sure you hear from God before you start a fast. But a, a complete fast is no food and no water. You do see those in the Bible, but those were only for a short period of time, unless God had miraculously giving, given more, uh, more grace for someone to do a complete fast longer. And then the regular fast is no food, only water. So how is it you're going to fast? What is, what is the way in which you're going to fast? So know that before you start the fast, and determine the duration of your fast. You going to fast for 24 hours? Is it going to be 48 hours? Is it going to be three days? Is it going to be a week? Is it going to be a longer period of time? Are you going to, are you going to fast as part of a regular discipline in your life? I know one, one a friend of mine who fasts one day every single week, sets aside that day for, for prayer and fasting. But know the duration in which you're going to fast. And in every fast, there's going to be a time savings. doesn't matter. If you're, if you're fasting screens, for instance— you're probably going to save a lot more time than just fasting food. If you're fasting food, you're just going to save whatever, how long it takes you to eat. If you're fasting your screen and your Facebook, for some people, you're going to save hours every day. So use that time in prayer. Use that time that you would normally grab that sandwich to be reminded, no, my hunger and thirst is for Christ. When you want to grab the phone and post a picture? No. My hunger and thirst is for God. Try it and see what God does. Probably many of you have never fasted before. You've never fasted anything. You've never even considered it. It's never been a part of your life. I, I want to challenge you. Try it. Just try it. Say, God, be honest. Say, God, I don't know. I've never done this before. I don't, I don't know all about this. Maybe I, I'm not really understand, but I, God, I'm going to step into this because I see it in your word. I see it was your expectation. You spoke to us. So I'm going to add this as a part of the discipline 
of my spiritual life. Jeremiah chapter 29. We love chapter 29 of Jeremiah. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. Don't we love that verse? I, I have that verse on a plaque hanging up, I believe, in my house. Anybody you, you say you got that one? Heard that verse before? We love that. Go a little bit further and you'll find this verse. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. That's almost a better promise than the other one, isn't it? You will seek me and find me when, when you seek me with your whole heart. Blessed are those, Jesus said, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Give fasting a try. As a church, we're calling 30 days of prayer beginning this coming Saturday, going to Pentecost Sunday. We want as a church to agree together in a special season of, of prayer. Now, we're not calling this prayer for any one specific reason other than because we want to seek God and find Him when we seek Him with our whole heart. So we've got these prayer journals. These are some more practical helps. Now, I erase that. Prayer guides. They're not journals. Uh, you look at a journal, you're just going to say, well, it's not journal because it should show me Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It's not like that at all. This is a prayer guide, which will just allow you to sort of add to your prayer life. Maybe if you're brand new, beginning this for the first time, and I know there are several that are here that are sort of new to these things, this would be a great help to go through this, and it gives you a scripture verse, it gives you a, a, a directed prayer, and even a, a written prayer in which you can go through and make that a part of your daily walk with the Lord. The last thing I, I want to say about, about fasting is the same thing that Jesus said about prayer. I told my sons, I got some good advice for you, boys. So what is that, Dad? He said, don't be an idiot. I got that from Michael Scott, by the way. So every time you think to yourself, would an idiot do that? If the answer is yes, then don't do that thing, right? Don't be an idiot. Jesus said about prayer and fasting, he said, don't be a hypocrite. When you pray, don't be a hypocrite. When you fast, don't be a hypocrite. And if you go back one section before that in the same chapter, he says, and when you give, don't be a hypocrite. You get the point? How would a hypocrite do these things? How will a hypocrite give? How does a hypocrite pray? How does a hypocrite fast? What Jesus says, how do they do it? They do it so that other people can see them do it, so that they can brag about it, so they can take pride in it, and they can show everybody around them how, what a spiritual person that they are. And Jesus said, don't do that. Don't pray that way. Don't fast that way. When the Pharisees pray, they pray in the town hall so everybody can hear their prayers. And when the pagans pray, they babble on and on and on and on in repetition. Don't pray like that. Don't fast like this. But Jesus said in each one of these ca cases, he said, but your father, who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Look at this, Matthew 6, 18b. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So when you fast, you don't need to come up to me and say, hey, Pastor Joe, I'm fasting. These are how I fast. Don't tell. It's okay. We're, we're not keeping track. We're not keeping a scoreboard. This is what you decide to do and how you decide to do it. And if you decide, this is you. This is in your relationship with God. I just want to encourage you to go deeper in that relationship. To take a challenge and say, you know what? I'm going to take these 30 days that the church is doing this together, and I'm really going to spend time daily in prayer. Whether it's five minutes or ten minutes or an hour, I'm going to spend time in prayer. You know, as the church is calling on people to fast, I'm going to do that. Never done it before. But I'm going to ask God, God, how is it that you would like me to fast? And I'm going to, I'm going to do that. 
not going to brag about it, not going to be like the hypocrites in my doing of this, but I'm just going to seek after God. And God, Jesus said, will reward it. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me? In closing this morning, preparing our hearts to come to the communion table. If you're here today or you're online, you're watching, and, and maybe you don't have any spiritual life because you don't have a relationship with God, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I just want to invite you today to begin a relationship with Him that will transform your lives. It will transform you. That's what the Bible tells us. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. It says He makes all things new. We're not the same person anymore. We're a new creation, the Bible says. If you haven't become a new creation in Christ, it's a simple step of faith. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, the Word says, and believe in your heart, God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. The Word of God also says that He is faithful and just to forgive you to cleanse you from all sin, all wrongdoing. He's faithful. He desires this. He, he, he wants to do this in your life. So if you're here today, if you're watching online, I would just, just invite you to make a decision today. Step out in that faith, that act of faith, to receive Him as your Lord and Savior. If that's the case, I'm going to offer this prayer and you could pray one just like this. God wants to hear from you. You can pray a prayer just like this, but coming from your heart to God. And then at the end of the service, we'll have these altars open, and if you would like prayer, we would invite you to come forward for prayer. But Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for anyone that is here today that does not know you yet as their Lord and their Savior. I pray, God, that before this day is over, and even right now, that they would be calling out to you, confessing themselves to be in need of salvation, confessing you now to be the Lord and Savior of their life, believing that you are who you said you are, the risen Savior, the Son, the living God. So, Father, as they offer up their own prayer, I ask that you would just come into their life pray that you transform and change them, Lord. I pray that they would be a new creation. That they would leave here different than they came in. God, I pray that you would do that work, regenerating them in Jesus' name. And Father, for those that walk with you, that Lord, maybe, maybe they've never stepped into fasting before. Maybe they don't even have that regular discipline of a life of prayer. God, I pray that in the next days that are to follow, that you would just inspire and encourage them to seek you like they've never sought you before, God. To call out to you like they've never called out to you before. Some that are here today, God, they need protection. There's some that are here today, God, they need direction in their life. Some that are in crisis, oh God. Some that need healing. Some that are are calling out to you, God, for the salvation for someone who is lost. And Lord, I pray that they would begin to call out to you like never before and seek you in prayer and fasting. And God, as your word is truth, you said, and you will reward those. Reward us, God, with your presence. We would walk closer to you and know you better. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want us to turn our attention to the communion table today. You should have received a little cup as you walked in the door with juice and bread. But I ask that you would stand to your feet with me and in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. We are commanded in Scripture that we are to do this together. It's an act of faith and as a proclamation of the one who died and rose again for us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we receive instruction by Paul on how we are to receive communion. 
and what communion is all about and how it represents all that Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. So Paul says, what I receive from the Lord, I pass on to you. That the Lord Jesus, the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you're proclaiming the Lord's death till he come. It's a remembrance of what he has done and what he's accomplished, but it's also looking forward to his return. Are you thankful that Jesus did that in your life? He washed away your sin, that he made you a new creature. He took away all your guilt and all your shame. This communion is open to anyone that is a part of the family of God. If you read further, though, there's some warnings for us. Verse 27 says, So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. So everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So there's a warning attached to this. It's a blessing, but there's also the warning. This communion is not for those who don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It's not about being perfect, but it's about knowing Him as the Lord and Savior of your life, that you have put your faith in Jesus. If you haven't, then please refrain from receiving this communion. So Lord God, we thank you for the remembrance that we share together now in this. We thank you, God, for the sacrifice of your Son. We remember that sacrifice because it purchased our salvation. And, and God, we're also excited when we take this because we're looking forward to your return. In the meantime, we will proclaim the Lord's death. We give you thanks for this. Bless it now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. After you receive that bread and that juice, let's worship the Lord with our worship team.